There was a three-week gap between the Monaco race and the next round in Spain, and after President Reagan and Pope John Paul II, Queen Elizabeth II was the third target of an attempted assassination in as many months, or so it first appeared. In fact, the young assassin had only fired blanks, apparently motivated by a desire for fame rather than political change. After spending three years in prison, the young gunman apparently decided fame was overrated, changed his name and began a new life. Major League Baseball players began a strike over transfer rules, which would run until the end of July and cancel 713 games. Raiders of the Lost Ark opened the summer movie season in the US, with Superman 2, The Cannonball Run, Stripes, Arthur and Fioris only also proving box office hits. Less successful at the time, but enjoying retrospective cult status, were Escape from New York and An American Werewolf in London. In a make-or-break moment for the European space programme, an Ariane 1 rocket launched from French Guiana in South America placed a weather satellite and India's first space vehicle, an experimental communication satellite, in orbit. This was the third launch by the ESA, with the second having embarrassingly exploded before reaching orbit. The F-117 Nighthawk, the so-called stealth fighter, made its first flight in utmost secrecy. More public was the Israeli Air Force's attack on an Iraqi nuclear reactor at Ozirak. One of the Israeli pilots involved, Ilan Ramon, would go on to be Israel's first astronaut and died in the Columbia shuttle disaster in 2003. With David Thema, boss of the Essex oil firm, having been imprisoned in April on fraud charges, his friend Colin Chapman had begun looking around for a new title sponsor, as the future looked bleak for Essex as a going concern. A deal was struck, and the Lotus team arrived in Madrid with a very familiar look. The iconic black and gold of John Player Special was back, albeit with Essex still on the side pods. Elsewhere, Eliseo Salazar had abandoned the hapless March team and signed for Ensign, leaving Mark Sura out of a job. March decided to stick to one car rather than replace Salazar and focus their efforts on Derek Daly. Meanwhile, Ozella had replaced Piercarlo Gonzani after two races with fellow Italian Giorgio Francia. Born in 1947 in Bologna, Giorgio Francia had become the German Formula 3 champion in 1974, but had spent most of his driving career as a development driver for the Fiat Alfa Romeo Lancia Group, working mainly on sports cars and touring cars. Courtesy of Martini and Alfa Romeo, he had been given a whirl with the Brabham team in a third Brabham Alfa at the 1977 Italian Grand Prix, but not having done much single-seater racing, he didn't qualify. It was intended to, for him to drive for Azella full-time in 1981, but he lost out to better-funded Gabbiani and Guerra. Then, when Guerra was injured, he was again approached, but Fisa turned down his permit due to a lack of feeder series results, so Gonzani got the drive instead. Finally, for the Spanish Grand Prix, Giorgio Francia would get his second shot at Formula One. There had also been an attempt to enter the race by Emilio de Viotta, a local driver who had dabbled in a number of racing series, but had entered the Spanish Grand Prix for the last few years. The Maranello agreement prevented such one-off privateer entries, but he was a favourite of, and his main sponsor had ties to, one of the two Spanish motor clubs. Not only that, but he had recently won the British domestic Aurora AFX series, and would bring his customer Williams FW07 with him. A great prospect for the local fans. Team Banco Occidental arrived and set up for Friday practice, but while still trying to fix an engine misfire, the team was informed that their entry was illegal and was ejected from the pit lane. The Jarama circuit on the outskirts of Madrid is narrow, dusty and increasingly unsuitable for modern Formula One. Last year's race had fallen victim to the FISA focus squabbles and had been declared a non-championship race after it had been run without Ferrari, Renault or Alfa Romeo. The future of the Spanish Grand Prix generally was mired in internal politics between FISA and the two Spanish automobile clubs who shared responsibility for the race. Once the cars actually got going, Jacques Lafitte continued Ligier's revival by putting his car on pole for Sunday's race. Alongside Alan Jones, with Reutemann and John Watson on the second row, ahead of Prost's Renault and Giacomelli's Alfa Romeo. Villeneuve was seventh in the Ferrari, ahead of Andretti's second Alfa Romeo. Piquet disgruntled ninth in the Brabham, ahead of the Lotus twins, DeAngelis and Nancy. During qualifying, Beppe Gabbiani had a big crash in his Azella and commandeered his new teammate French's car, leaving poor Giorgio unable to set a time. Eliseo Salazar put his new car, the Ensign, on the grid in 24th place, two places behind his old teammate Derek Daly, who finally made it into the race in the march.
Sunday's temperatures were sky high and Lafitte fluffed his start, allowing both Williams cars to blast past and into the lead, followed by Gilles Villeneuve later on the first lap, clipping Prost's front wing in the process and forcing the Renault to pit. Then, at the end of lap one, the Ferrari got a tow from Reutemann, dodged out from behind and took second place. Jones, however, was busy pulling out a commanding lead, stretching it to ten seconds by lap 14, but lost concentration and went off. The marshals pushed him back on, but he dropped out of contention. Villeneuve went into the lead, Reutemann chasing, but he was having gear problems and Jacques Lafitte soon got back past in the Talbot Ligier. For the rest of the race, Lafitte nipped at Villeneuve's heels but just couldn't get past. The nimble Ligier had the edge in the corners, the powerful Ferrari on the straights. Reutemann kept a waiting brief, trusting in the unreliability of the Ferrari engine, and behind him Watson, De Angelis and Mansell all ducked and weaved, looking for a way past on the narrow, dusty surface. Watson got past Reutemann as well, and the five front runners remained a close train of cars for the rest of the race, crossing the line just 1.24 seconds apart, the closest finish to a Formula 1 race there had ever been, at the end of one of the most mesmerising races to watch. Short on dramatic incident, maybe, but long on sustained entertainment. Gilles Villeneuve's second win on the trot seemed to confirm that Ferrari were back, and Lafitte's fine second place suggested it might not be much longer before Ligier were back to winning ways as well. More significantly for the championship, Reutemann had picked up three points for fourth place, with Jones and Piquet both once again failing to trouble the scorers. At the halfway point of the season, the Argentines' prospects of finally winning the world championship were looking good.